I'd like you to look at Luke chapter 1 at a text that uh, all over the world people are turning to right this morning. Father in heaven, our Christmas time begins with our remembrance of that blessed event, the most significant event of all of history, of God coming among us, becoming one of us, that we might become like unto him. And so fascinate us with the beauty of him. In Jesus' name, amen. Luke chapter 1 and verse 26. Let me begin with these words that it has been said, and rightly so, that human religion and human philosophy, man summoning up his morality and man summoning up his own in intellect, that human religion and human philosophy are man's search for God and man's explanation of God. It begins with man reaching for and man explaining. Jesus Christ is God's search for man and God's explanation of himself to man in the word that became flesh. No one thought of Christianity. Uh, it didn't evolve. It is not the result of uh, Paul sitting under the Bodhi tree and all of a sudden being enlightened of the Trinity. No, it, it is not Jewish or Christian philosophy. Christ was a bolt out of the blue something that God had purposed from eternity, prophesied in the Old Testament. But when it occurs, nobody knows what's happening. The most oft-mentioned statement when Christ makes his annunciation is, uh, and they were sore afraid. When he said he goes to the cross, they say, this will never happen to you. And so it is an idea from God and an event from God for man that man can't understand, fathom, nor does he even agree with. Well, it begins with Christmas, the Annunciation. In verse 26, in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city in Galilee. When it says sixth month, that's the sixth month of her, second, of her cousin Elizabeth's pregnancy. When Elizabeth got pregnant, she went into seclusion. No one would be talking about what was happening. There would be no rumors from man, starting with man, about the coming of the forerunner. Well, how about Zacharias? Maybe he would tell. No, there's a problem there, you remember. He got struck silent. And so he can't tell, as Elizabeth isn't telling, she's in seclusion. So Christianity will not break by man's figuring out anything. We're not going to trace the faith back to some guy in, in Judea who sees an old pregnant woman whose husband got struck dumb and start putting two and two together. No, no one knows what's happening. And so Gabriel is sent from God. Matter of fact, Gabriel means the man of God. He is sent by God, his man, in a sense, to this city in Galilee called Nazareth. He comes from heaven to earth. Suddenly he appears. He's not going to bring a religion or a philosophy. He's going to bring the annunciation of an event, something God planned, something God prophesied, now something God is going to perform. He is going to come from a heavenly throne to a little bitty country in a little bitty region called Galilee, West Virginia, to a little bitty city, very small home with a very small girl. The Bible says of God that he takes his delight in the sons of men. He looks at the universe and says it's good. He looks at man and says it's very good. No matter how small this woman is and small these humans are, God comes right down to her because he delights in humans. 
They're his image. They fellowship with him. They are his creation. In a sense, they are his sons by creation. He delights in them. No two look alike. No two uh, are inseparable. Some close, but they're not inseparable. They're unique among all the creation. And so he comes to this small city. And in verse 27, to a virgin, engaged to a man whose name is Joseph. More important than the woman here is the husband at the outset. He is a very special man. He is a carpenter. He is a Nazareth. But he is from the lineage of King David of Bethlehem. He is of David, the Jewish king, through whom God pronounced that the Messiah would be the son of David. One of the most oft-mentioned, you can't miss it, ideas of the scripture is who the Redeemer will be. He will be the seed of woman who crushed the serpent's head. He will come through Seth. He will come through Enoch, through Noah through Shem, the Semites, through Abraham, through Isaac, through Jacob, from Judah, from Jesse, David, and Joseph. It gets narrower and narrower. There's a lot of things you can mess up on in the Bible, but you can't mess up on who the Redeemer will be. It's going to be a Jew from Bethlehem in the lineage of King David. And so he states in 27... He is of the descendants of David. And he's not just of the descendants. This is the man. This is the guy with the birthmark, is Joseph. He is, it's a sad story, he's the man who would have been king. Whenever he would drive by Jerusalem, he would turn to Mary and say, if Israel hadn't broke the covenant, there we'd be. You would be like, Bathsheba of old, you would be like the queens of old. It's not my fault. The nation went south, we got judged. But God has preserved that lineage. Whenever they went into captivity, the Bible said that Jehoahaz was preserved all the way through that captivity. When they came out of captivity, Zerubbabel was preserved. That little coal of divine fire, the promise of his word. And it got preserved all the way to Joseph. Uh, I'm sure he wonders, here I am a carpenter. I'm making chairs for other men instead of sitting on a throne. I should have been Joseph the first, but I'm not. But God knows right where he is And God knows who he is. And God has found him. God's prophetic syndrome. GPS. And he has found him. The girl gets the most common of all names. Her name is Mary. From the name of Joseph's sister. I'm sorry. Moses' sister Miriam. Mary is a name replete in the Old Testament. She's as common as as she can be, that's about to be married to a very uncommon man. And Luke adds that she is a virgin. Why that would be important to us, most Jewish girls who get married are going to be virgins in that day. Why would he want to tell us this? This is important to the narrative. In verse 28, and coming in, apparently angels knock, and he said to her, Greetings, woman richly blessed, favored one. The Lord is with you. But she was very perplexed at this statement and kept pondering what kind of salutation this was. The angel said, don't be afraid. Why would that salutation bother you? Greetings, the Lord is with you. Because it's a term in the Old Testament that's given by God to deliverers who are about to go to war. God said to Gideon, The Lord is with you, valiant warrior. And he said, well, where is he? He's with me. All these things have happened. And he said, you will defeat the Midianites as one man. 
for I am with you. Moses said, what will I tell him? Whenever I say we're, we're to leave Egypt, he just said, he said, who am I? He said, you tell him that I am with you. David said, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, thou art with me. Moses, Gideon, David. It's the term of God's presence with a future deliverer. And so rightly does Mary wonder, what kind of greeting is this? Well, this small girl in verse 31 is going to bring deliverance to the entirety of mankind by a baby out of the mouths of babes and nursing infants. Thou hast established strength. God is going to give a child and that baby is going to grow up to deliver the world like Moses as one man, like Gideon as one man. In verse 30, you found favor with God and you will conceive in your womb and bear a son and you'll call his name Jesus and he will be great and called the Son of the Most High. You are going to give birth to the very Son of God. You're going to conceive down inside of your womb, you're going to have a baby, a man. And he will be the very son of the Most High God. And we're going to name him Jesus. He's the son of the Most High, and we're going to name him Yeshua. A play on words from Joshua, another redeemer that took Israel in to where Moses couldn't lead him. He will take by grace... God is salvation, Joshua, Yeshua, Jesus, where Moses cannot take you in law. And so the play on words here, Son of God, conceived in you, Jesus, you're going to have a man, you're going to have a deity, and they're going to unite at conception. This is not going to be an, a visitation of God appearing to man. This is not going to be a um, theophany, an appearance of God to humanity in full mature form, as often you see in the Old Testaments. The angel of the Lord, the pre-incarnate Son of God, appearing and then leaving. No, this isn't what it's going to be. He's not going to come and go. You're going to conceive. He'll be the Son of God. He'll be united with humanity. We're going to name him Jesus, the Son of God. He's going to be a theanthropic person. God, theos, man, anthropos. He'll be the only theanthropic person that has ever lived. He will be undiminished deity, perfect humanity, united in one person without confusion. And without separation, forever, there will be a perfect communion of his attributes between God and man. He will lay aside his glory, lay aside his independent use of deity to escape humanity. And he will be hungry and he will die and go through what all of us go through, even though he will be the bread of life and he will be the way, the truth, and the life. So we have no explanation. We have no parallel for what you are about to bring forth. God is about to become one of us. And in this man, God will be understood. We'll look at him and we will see what we can understand. In him, man will be understood. You will say, behold the man. You'll know what a man is. We're going to look at him as satisfying justice. You will know what a righteous life is. If you ever thought you were good enough for heaven, I'm going to give you a standard that you can put yourself up to. Not pen and ink, but flesh and blood. You're going to have to put yourself up next to him. And in him we will find no guilt. In him justice will be appeased on his cross. On him death will be conquered by his resurrection. Satan will be defeated and now salvation will be made possible to bestow upon any of God's good pleasure. 
this man is going to complete the Bible. The Old Testament that looked to him is now going to have the New Testament that explains him. What began with Genesis will end with the revealing, the end. And there will be a complete document given to man by which he can know God. One of pen and ink that will point at somebody of flesh and blood. And you can take a genetics, a guy with a genetics test of a seven, who can now read the Bible and understand who God is. You can now teach about him to Sunday school kids. Amen? He is the Rosetta Stone. Y'all know what I'm talking about? In Egypt, the Egyptian culture to us prior to the end of the 1700s was off limits. I mean, we looked at those pyramids, we looked at all those mummies and all that stuff, but we didn't understand that culture because we couldn't make out hieroglyphics until Napoleon tried to take North Africa and got de defeated by what? Mosquitoes. He turned and ran. But he tried to take North Africa. And he had a particular brilliant young linguist named Champollion. And he took a piece of hieroglyphic writing called the Rosetta Stone. And this Frenchman figured it out. He correlated what he saw with ideas. And now he put it into French. And all of a sudden, the Egyptian world that was off limits to us was at our fingertips. Christ was the Rosetta Stone. When he becomes a man, now we know who God is. We know what man is. We know what he should be. We know what salvation is. And so... In verse 33, in verse 32, this man is not just going to be hers, but in verse 32, he'll be called son of the most high and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. It's not just hers. Joseph is going to be the legal father conferring Davidic title and royal title. He's not just going to be a man. He's going to be the Jewish king. Even though the nation is ruled by the Romans, he is going to be, as Isaiah said, a shoot springing out of dry ground. Life out of a, the dead trunk of a tree. He's going to be a shoot. And in verse 32, he will fulfill the Davidic covenant. God will give him the throne, the house, and the kingdom of David forever. He will be the Omega Man. He will rule the world forever. No, rightly does he say in verse 32, he will be great. That is one of the greatest biblical understatements of all time. He will be great. He will bring the earth to its end. In verse 34, Mary said to the angel, how can this be since I am a virgin? Been a lot of talk about the validity of the virgin birth. Mary thought she was a virgin. That is called primary resource material. <laughs> Joseph thought she was a virgin. God thought she was a virgin. Holy Spirit thought she was a virgin. Isaiah thought she'd be a virgin. So Mary is a virgin. I guess she would know. And she says, as she should say, this is impossible. It is beyond reason. It is beyond science. It is beyond experience. It is beyond logic. This can't be. This is not normal. This is not within the framework of what is normal. This will be an act of God. It better be prophesied by God, it better be planned by God, and it better be done by God. Because Mary says, if this is a closed system of just natural causes of man bringing about stuff, it's not going to happen. This is impossible. Gabriel said in verse 35, I know. 
the angel answered and said, here's where it's going to come from. It's outside of you. He agrees with Mary. It is not rational, scientific, and paralleled. The Holy Spirit will come upon you. And the power of the Most High. In the Old Testament, that would be translated El Elyon. The Most High God. This is an infinite power acting above you. And He will overshadow you. Meaning it's going to be something in the dark. It's going to be like Sinai in the dark. No one's going to see it. It's going to be like the Holy of Holies in the dark. No one's going to see it. No theologian is going to sit down rationally and explain it. No anthropologist is going to explain it. It is like we say in Texas, it's an M-A-R-K-L-E. It's a miracle. <laughs> David Hume said a miracle is something that can't happen. Well, it's a miracle. The written word of God, the Bible is just like the living word of God. How can you have a Bible without mistakes written by men? Answer, you can't. But the Holy Spirit inspires men with error and protects them from error so that you get a book written by humans that humans can read that expresses the divine idea in our medium. How can you have a sinful woman, Mary said, my soul rejoices in God my Savior. How can you have a sinful woman give birth to a man that has no sin? Well, just as the Holy Spirit overcame human authors, the Holy Spirit overcomes a fallen human mother. Whereas you have a book without error, you have a man without sin. Now people can read and know who God is. Now men can look and they can see who God is. They can approach him. And so Mary said, this is impossible. And Gabriel said, amen. This is impossible. And what he's going to be in verse 35, the Greek says, the holy thing begotten. What does an angel call Christ for the first time? The holy thing begotten. He's holy because he's God from the conception. He's begotten because he's a man. But God and man together, he's a holy thing, singular. We've never seen anybody like him. And we will call him the Son of God. He will lose none of his deity. He will be nothing less than man, just from sin apart. In verse 36, as a sign, even your relative Elizabeth, who has also conceived a son in her old age, she who was barren is in her sixth month. And she didn't know this. Nobody knows this but Elizabeth. She's not talking. Zacharias, he can't talk. You know it. In a little while, Joseph's going to know it. And so you run to see her. And as soon as you walk inside the house, the baby is going to leap in her womb because the Old Testament will now come to life because the new has come. And you two ladies will sit around knowing what nobody has ever known. And so the Annunciation shall come from God. No one will be able to say that a human being came up with this. In verse 36, she is now in her sixth month. She is showing. You don't have to take it by faith. Verse 37, here's why. Nothing will be impossible with God. You should have in your cross-references a slew of cross-references for this. This is one of the most oft-mentioned verses in the Old Testament. Pele, P-E-L-E, means wonderful above us, beyond our understanding. Abraham was told he would have a child, and he laughed. God said, why do you laugh? Nothing will be Pele. For God, nothing is too wonderful. You, I'm going to make you a hundred-year-old daddy. Can you say T-ball? 
you about to coach it. You got a minivan? You better get one. Because you're about to haul him around. Unbelievable. No, Pele. It's impossible. It's too good to be true. Moses was told to feed Israel. He said, shall I pull up all the fish of the sea? God said, is the Lord's power limited? Nothing shall be impossible. Pele, wonderful outside of God. Jeremiah was told, buy some property, because even though you're exiled, you're going to come back and you're going to be right here. He said, ah, Lord God, you made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arm. Is anything to Pele? Is there any dream too great that I can't dream? David said, where shall I go to flee from thy spirit? If I go to heaven, you're there. If I go to Sheol, you're there. If I take the wings of dawn, you're there. Such knowledge is too, anybody know the text? Too wonderful. I cannot attain to it. You're beyond my expectation. The pre-incarnate Christ, the angel of Jehovah in the book of Josh, uh, Judges appears to the parents of Samson. They say, what's your name so that when this occurs, we can honor you? Why do you ask, seeing that it's Pele? I can't tell you. I'm the second person of the triune Godhead. Same substance as the Father, different in person. Are you with me? No, no, no. I can't tell you. There's some truth that is just above us. The hidden things known to God, things revealed are for us. Whenever the man said to Jesus, if you can do anything, help me. Jesus said, if I can, all things are possible with God. He said to the disciples, if you have faith, you can say to this mountain, move. It'll be moved into the sea. Nothing will be impossible. Isaiah chapter 9. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor. He is going to bring us things as a counselor that we've never heard. Once this man comes, we're going to have to begin a whole new vocabulary. Incarnation, justification by faith, trinity, homoousia, same substance. Justification by faith, sola fide. The finished work of Christ, atonement. We're going to have to invent an entire vocabulary. They said to the Men of the temple, did y'all arrest him like I told you to? Never a man spoke like this man. He spoke not as the rest, but as one having authority. This man had come from heaven itself. He'd been there. His name shall be called Wonderful. Mary simply says in verse 37 or verse 38, it's done. Behold the bond slave of God. Same thing she said when Jesus performed his first miracle. They ran out of wine. Old Testament says when Messiah shows up, the hills will flow with sweet wine. It says you will take his donkey and tie it to the choice vine. And so she said, son, they're out of wine. Bring it on. And Jesus said, woman, madam, what to me and thee? My time is not yet come. And he put himself over Mary, she underneath him. She now turns to the servants and says, whatever he says to you, do it. In perfect submission, behold the bond slave of God. You know, let me rant for just a second. Our day we live in used to be, people said, there's a God who's made himself known. The question is, what is the truth? Lutherans say this, Presbyterians say this, Baptists say this, the liberals say this. What within the revealed word of God is true? That was always the question up until about the late 1800s. Now we got educated beyond our intelligence. Now the thought is, this is not true. And man cannot know anything outside of himself. All that we have is science empiricism, even your reason is subject to cause and effects. And it gave birth to what is called secularism. 
humanism, atheism. And so now it's not guys that have an idea that there's a God, we're not sure what he said. It's the guys that say, there is a God and we can know what he said, they're called Christians. And then the guys who say, these guys are crazy. Because this group over here says, nature is a closed system of natural law. Things operate like they do because they have to operate like they do because of nature. And you can't go beyond that to know what is the soul, the mind, God, salvation, anything. It's all off limits to you. And we're, that's why I think we've got such a passion for UFOs. Maybe we can find water on Mars. Maybe there's some kind of paramecium down there. Maybe there's some kind of carbon, something that is moving. Maybe there's... Did y'all see, remember years ago when they found a meteorite and thought, hey, I think I see bacterial strains in there. Everybody went crazy. Found that it was nothing. They looked and saw the canals on Mars, what they thought were the canals on Mars, and they thought they had some kind of geometric shape to them. Everybody went crazy. Found out it was scratches on the lens. It's <laughs> a fact. The most horrid notion in the world is a closed system of natural causes. Where man is today, secularly, is the worst nightmare of human history. That there's nobody out there but you. You're an accident. You're a cosmic orphan. You can look into the blackness of the cosmos, and there's no answer. You can put up all the big sonar that you want, but you're not going to pick up anything. You'd give anything if you could just get a boop, beep, boop, boop. Oh, it would just thrill your soul that there's a sense of order. But you're not going to find it. God will tell you who he is. And so God, by his word and by his son, and in this annunciation, God penetrates. Mary says this is impossible. Gabriel says this is impossible but it's happening. The creation came out of nothing. It's not a closed system. It wasn't just a big bang. Something from the outside. By faith we believe that the heavens were created by the word of God. So we believe in an open system as soon as we look at the creation with its beauty, its order, its morality. Somebody put it there. Calvin called it the sensei divinitas. It's a sense of divinity, and man is culpable for rejecting that. When I look at man, we didn't just assemble. Something from the outside made us. When I look at the intricacies of nature, something from the outside made this. Effects are not greater than causes. His invisible attributes, eternal power, divine nature, clearly seen, understood through what has been made, they are without excuse. Now, we live in a world that stuff is outside of us. The first time some guy runs across the yellow, uh, what's that thing? Light, yeah. And he hits you and he says, I'm not going to pay insurance. You're going to jump to an open system real quick. I need a judge outside of us with absolute divine law that's going to make you pay. No. None of us believe in a closed system that there's nothing out there. None of us believe that this is a machine going pocket to pocket to pocket to pocket to pocket to pocket. Somebody made it and somebody put it here. And thus you can have a creation by God and man in the image of God and history can go someplace because it's put there by God. And you can have salvation that is enacted by God and a savior that God so loved the world he gave his only son that whosoever believes shouldn't perish but have life eternal. We believe that. It is the greatest of all possibilities. I don't have to be religious. I have an atonement. I don't have to be brilliant as a philosopher. I have a virgin birth. I have an incarnation. Now all of us are on the same level. And now the coin of the realm is not brilliance. It is yieldedness to what is blatantly in front of you. And I can have a Christian life that I don't have to be a deist and just hold that there's a bunch of stuff happening and God doesn't care, the absentee landlord. 
I can say all things work together for good. Amen? I can say this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. I can say in whatever I suffer, God is there. Give God time. I can say when, as we all will say on anything, that the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh. He is the blessed giver and he's the blessed taker. Blessed be the name. I can believe that though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, that he is with me. He'll never leave me. and He'll never forsake me. I can believe that surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. And then I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And then he'll transform my body and there will be final judgment from the outside. See, that's the difference today between us and the world. In the old days, Christians were guys that interpreted the document literally. Others interpreted the document partially. Today, we don't have a change in thinking. We have a change in how we think. We believe there's somebody out there. We believe it's absolute and you can't live without it. They believe that there is nobody. It's just us. That is horror. This is the greatest of all possibilities. Well, if you ever go to Jerusalem, you see the Dome of the Rock. You know what's written on the Dome of the Rock? Whenever the Muslims would take over a synagogue or a church, they would destroy it and they'd put up a mosque in its place. Ishmael taking the place of Esau, of uh, Isaac. They'd always take his place. And it says on the Dome of the Rock in Arabic, God is no father and he has no son. Ishmael, right in the presence of Isaac. This is my ground right here. God didn't, Abraham didn't offer up Isaac. He offered up Ishmael. We're the completion of what you Christians and Jews messed up. That's us. Because they, they put that on their dome of the rock because they understand that if it is true that God is Trinity and he has a son and the son became a man and died on the cross, then nothing else is true but that. And that's what this teaches. And this is the Christ you come to know when you get saved. Paul said, when he who had me set apart from my mother's womb and called me through his grace was pleased to reveal his son in me. Now Paul knew who Christ was. God had to reveal Christ in it's not just a historic Jesus or the Jesus of the creeds or the songs or the carols. It's the divine person who became a human person to come and fulfill the Davidic covenant and that can actually come into my life. That's what salvation is. Jesus said to the 12, after a little while, the world will not see me, but you'll see me. Because I live, you will live also. God is about to put eyes in your soul and you're going to see me. And he is revealed to the soul of the spiritual man. By the word of God, he witnesses to us that I am there and I love you. You know, when I was in the dorm room at North Texas, that guy came and shared with my roommate and he said to him, Jesus is alive and he can come into your life if you will let him. And my life was never the same. He is alive. This person is alive. Have you met him? You sing about him. Maybe do a creed about him. Have you met him by faith that whoever received him that said, come in. To them he gave the right to become sons of God. He will not debate with you. You want him and he will come. And he will give you life. He will not give you a rose garden. Have you all discovered that? He will someday, but until then, he will take you step at a time. You will run and not grow weary, walk and not faint. You have to run, you have to walk, and I will be there step by step. And it will resolve, and it will be for good. That is the Savior that we come to know. Did you ever see the movie Field of Dreams? Kent, even you saw that. Did you see Field of Dreams? I did. boy. And Field of Dreams. James Earl Jones, Darth Vader, <laughs> the disenchanted author, 
is brought to the field of dreams. And he realizes in this sci-fi that this is not just a cornfield. That this is a place where dreams occur. That your greatest wishes happen. And he says to Kevin Costner, people are going to come here from all over. They won't know why they're coming. They're just going to be drawn here. Because in this world that has just gone down and gone down and gone down and gone down, there is one redeeming thing that does not change. What is that? Baseball. <laughs> That's why we call it a diamond, I guess. It doesn't change. And here, you can find it. And there's a reality beyond this one for beaten people. And he goes to the back of that cornfield. You remember? James Earl Jones. He sees people disappearing into it, which would scare the pajamas out of me. I, I'm not following shoeless Joe Jackson <laughs> into any place. But he puts his hand in it, and it disappears just a little bit. And he realizes this is a lot bigger than I thought. It looks so common, but there's a world open to me. And he goes... <laughs> and then he disappears. See, that's the way you become a Christian. You just kind of feel in there. You read, you talk. <laughs> then you step in. Well, that's Christianity. This is the mystery of our faith. This is the splendor of what we believe. You know, I'll give you something that's just my personal thought on this. It's always amazed me. Joseph and Mary. Joseph is the guy in the Old Testament that is the good shepherd hated by his brothers, thrown into a pit to watch him die, betrayed by a brother named what? Judas. For the price of a slave, and so they don't merely kill him, they sell him to the hands of the Gentiles. Lie to their father and break his heart. And live a lie. And that's what Israel did to Christ. Joseph is a play on words in Hebrew. It means to add or to take away. He can add or he can take away. Just like Christ can bestow righteousness, he can take away sin. Add and take away. And so Joseph is thought to be dead, but he's not dead. He is risen from the dead and he's among the Gentiles and he's the bread of life. And then his brothers come under great tribulation and he breaks them and brings them to faith and he becomes the savior of the world. Joseph. Miriam. Mary. Bitter. Mara. They came to those springs and they were Mara. They're bitter. Moses' sister is Miriam. The older sister who always wants to control, she's bitter. Well, you have to take the tree and throw it into the mirror, and it becomes sweet. And so here is Joseph, and here is Mara, and they are wed together, the Redeemer and bitterness, and the tree is cast in. And the water is sweet. That's our atonement. Would you like to do that this day? Pray with me. Heavenly Father, maybe there's a man or a woman here this morning who has never put their faith in the living, virgin-born Son of God. Maybe they have followed after Oxford and um, London and Moscow and Paris and Budapest, and Vienna. Maybe they have followed after uh, Taipei. Maybe they have followed after all of the thoughts of men. But I pray that this morning that they might rest in the self-evident word of God and their prayer would be, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, holy thing. You who grew up perfect and died for me, come into my life and into my heart and save me. Might this be the day of rebirth? We call on you, O oh God.
through Christ our Lord.